Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. I'm Scott McTaggart. Over the last 20 years, I've been a sales rep, a marketer, a manager, an executive, a consultant, and an advisor. This show is designed to give you access to my list of contacts so that you can learn more about how to present your ideas at work and succeed in your career. Startups and salespeople, marketers and managers, from the Epicast Network in Pittsburgh, it's the Pitchworks Podcast. Like, basically, I tell people, like, if you walk out of a sales meeting and you can't tell me a couple objections you've heard, you've failed me. Like, I want to hear the objections. I want to hear what they didn't like about it, um, because that's where you really establish trust with people. I think it would be fun to do a training together. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. It's Scott and another week, another guest. Happy Wednesday. Today, we're talking to Coach Aaron Schiller. Before you start wondering why he's a coach, trust me, this is all cool. It's on the level. He's not going to blow his whistle. He's not going to make you run laps. I've known Aaron for a little bit, and we've been talking for probably two or three years now just because I appreciate the way he does things, and and he brings something very unique to the table. Aaron got started working in education and from education moved into sales. Me personally, I come from a family of salespeople and educators, and I can tell you there's an awful lot in common between those two disciplines. In fact, they're the same job. Really, honestly, if we're being honest, you've got to get your information across in both of those jobs. You've got to be watching to make sure people are paying attention, and ultimately, you've got to persuade people to absorb the information, and be able to recall it at the time when it's important. So whether that be a test or a purchase order, you know, okay, there's a little bit of a departure there. But you're asking people to follow you along as you present information. Aaron's a great guy. I love him. I love his energy. He's just a good person. And one of the things that's really interesting is that he's daring. He gets out there and says things that nobody else is saying. And you're going to find out there's some pretty important people listening to him. So have a listen. This is a remote interview we did with Aaron Schiller from CoachSchiller.com, a good friend of mine, and and just, again, just a great spirit. All right, folks, it's that time again. Welcome back to the Pitchworks podcast. We've got somebody who wears multiple hats, but also can talk to us about, you know, the things that a lot of you are doing day to day. Let me introduce Aaron Schiller. He's a coach. He's a consultant. He's He's got a giant hat rack. Aaron, how you doing? I'm doing well. I'm excited to be here. I know you are. You've been you telling are. me how much you want to get on here. And I, I you know, I I was waiting for the right time. The, and this is it. The, well, it is it. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where's your home base? Yeah, so I'm in, uh, I'm right outside San Francisco in a town called Mill Valley, California. And, uh, you know, I'm right here in the tech kind of epicenter. And so, you know, I have a really interesting um, opportunity where I support people in a lot of different functions. Sometimes I'm working with, uh, you know, founders and executives, and sometimes I'm working with those same people because they're dads. One thing that everyone has to do when they come here on the Pitchworks podcast is they have to pitch me and pitch our audience on what it is that they do. So I think that's great. I've been waiting for this all day. Is, is this that moment now? I get to pitch you. This, this is, is like that moment. This is that moment. This is it, man. All right. I hope I don't freeze up. So the thing I wanted to pitch you and the rest of the the audience is is pretty simple. Um, I've found that as a salesperson who's not currently always in sales mode, um, that I'm extremely valuable to organizations who are trying to sell a product. And, I, and I'll tell you why. When when someone goes to try to sell their own thing, they get really excited about it. And they think they maybe done some market research and they built their product and they're all excited about it. And then they try to go sell it and it doesn't always work. And what I've found is that by bringing in someone like myself, as a, either as a coach to train salespeople or as a consultant to actually get the narrative and the product right, and I'll come back to what I mean by the product right, um, they can get some really um, good dose of reality and some really honest feedback that I think people who don't have background in sales can deliver. And so what do I mean by that? Somebody could come to me and say, um, I want to sell. Um, to me, it really doesn't matter what the product. It could be a, an ad unit um, with a new video component. Um, it could be a, a, a toy for kids. Um, it could be 
a a new type of glass um, for you know the a kitchen cup. Very diverse products. Very diverse products. To me, it's less relevant. For me, what I'm trying to do and what I want to help your audience and even you, if you need help with it, is to match the dream of what you're trying to do with products that people are actually going to buy. And and let me tell you how I do it. I do it based on how excited I am to go out and sell that thing. So when someone tells me about their product, I'm sitting there basically going, "Could I sell this?" Would I risk everything that I have? Would I put my own Your communicating um, livelihood? Emotion. Yeah, I'm putting my whole livelihood on the line to be able to go out and sell that product. So the basic concept is this, is that like my, the thing that I, I do, I base everything on in the sales world is how excited I get about selling that. Yeah. And if I'm not excited You're communicating about emotion. It, yeah, absolutely. Well, that's what sales is, right? The reason I'm a good salesperson, regardless of what I'm selling, is because I'm going to connect with the person I'm selling to. And they're going to trust me that what I'm selling them is actually a really good product that's going to make their life better or help them in some way. Now, can I dissect your pitch a little bit? Please. Okay. So I'll tell you what I like. Okay. Is that you start off with, whenever you, you, you go to a different point that you're trying to make, you start off with the simple. You say, yeah. let me tell you what is important. Let me tell you why I do that, right? I, I like the the sort of headers that you put in. So you've got like chapter headings. Right. Um, let me tell you how I do that, I think is probably the, the, the closest I'm going to come to a proper quote. You said, mm-hmm. let me tell you how I do that. And then you kind of expand on the idea so that as people start to sort of stray away, you know, everyone has a very short attention span these days. Um, you're, you're kind of grabbing them back again. You know, because your enthusiasm punches into those chapter headings as you deliver your pitch. I, I yeah. heard that. You know, it's like that's definitely here's my important thesis to of this paragraph, and then let me right. tell you how I know that to be true. I think you have to be able to communicate the emotion on some level at some point, right? You have to say like, "This is interesting and more interesting than the thing I used to work on or work with," or "This improvement to the product is better because," right? And people need to know that you're you're sincere in that. This is exciting to me. It's state of the art. It's an improvement. It's a reduction in cost. It's an improvement in output. Whatever the whatever the pitch is, I think in any pitch situation, I I have to do my best to read the room. And I think yeah. definitely being on your show and feeling like I'm speaking to you in a wider audience definitely made mm-hmm. me feel amped up. People are attached to the things that they do. There are real people who are making these companies, creating products, um, selling products, and who those people are and how they live their life oftentimes affects the outcome of what they're trying to do. And so I like being able to talk about that and know that. And I think that's important. This is, I do this a lot with, with sales coaching is to really help salespeople um, be better at attuning to their audience and knowing Mm -hmm. not only what their audience um, is like in terms of what level of um, excitement or simplicity or even complexity that the audience is going to need. Right. So for example, if I'm selling to, um, you know, a more technical audience. I, I'm somebody who will almost always bring a technical person with me. Your operation, you actually did carry a bag and work in sales, right? That's true. I did. And you I worked did. for some pretty big companies. Yeah, I, I was really fortunate. You know, I, I would even say even before that. So I really learned um, everything I know about sales from uh, working with kids. When I first got married, I worked um, in group homes and with kids um, who really ha- were pretty disadvantaged and um, some of them were wards of the state. Many of them had severe behavior challenges. And uh, they taught me a lot about people and communication and what it means to convey things um, in pretty nuanced ways. And and then I did get into sales many years later. Um, and the reason I share that story about working with kids is that it's actually what trained me to be a salesperson. I had no formal training. I just uh, had some products. Uh, one of the first products was um, working for an advertising agency, selling sort of the future of sustainable advertising. Um, which people sustain- didn't even know. Wait, 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 wait. What's sustainable advertising? Yeah, I mean, at the time, it didn't make sense either. A sustainable advertising. No, I'm, I, I'm not. I'm not mocking it. I seriously don't know. Yeah, and it was at the time. It was you know positioning new products that hadn't been sold, like cold water Tide, right? For you know, since the beginning of Tide, they were selling big boxes, and you'd go to Walmart and you'd buy a big box of detergent, and then all of a sudden they were trying to push um, a little small concentrated bottle because it was much better for the environment. It was less um, waste. It was less water usage. Um, and they really didn't know how to sell it and how to reach audiences. And so, yeah, you got to be able to reach the right people for that. But actually, I swear to you, I thought you meant sustainable, like the ad- advertising itself was sustainable. And I'm scratching my head going, maybe I've been doing this wrong. Anyway, I mean, people try to do that stuff, right? There was like eco-friendly billboards. In the end of the day, advertising is a pretty, you know, um, 
wasteful endeavor, right? Because it's it right- really, yeah, it tends to be very wasteful. Yeah, billboards come and go. Um, but it was just interesting trying to sell these kind of, mar- and basically I was selling marketed services. So it was, I was selling thin air in a lot of ways. Um, and that's where I really started. And then I got more into the tech and I started working for a company called Causes, um, better known as Facebook Causes. It was one of the first Facebook apps. It was founded by Sean Parker. Um, so we had some decent um, bandwidth. And when I started, we had a pretty big audience and um, a lot of opportunities to do some cool products um, that hadn't been tested. They had kind of been running off a pretty simple advertising revenue model. And then I got to come in and sell a more corporate level um, advertising engagement program. So I, I, yeah. I love the story so far, right? And, and yeah. actually, you jumped right into the thing that, that I love about your story, which is the fact that you came from, I'm going to characterize it as education. Um, you know, I, I know that you, you know, you point out that these are in a lot of cases, not necessarily your straight up education cases, like people would think of like, you know, standing in front of a third grade class. Right. But, uh, instead working with special needs and, and wards of the state and those types of things. But there's such a huge education component to what we do. And I love the fact that somebody took you from one and then put you into sales and it just plain worked. I mean, you've been at this now for years. Yeah, my boss uh, at Causes always laughs because I, you know, I, I won't say I fudged the truth, but I, I definitely stretched my sales experience to get the job. But the one of the <laughs> ways I closed them at the end of the interview was I said something bold like, you know, if I can't close you on hiring me, I have a really small chance of selling any of your product. I've interviewed a lot of people. That's that's maybe happened to me three times where yeah. somebody said that because it's the truth, right? Like that's I I'm funny like that. I love interviewing for sales jobs. Because it's just like, it, it puts me in my perfect environment where the, I know what they're trying to assess. I know what my goal is. My goal is not to convince them um, that I'm the good fit for the job. My job is to close them and I am the product. You, you, you went from this education background working with, I would say, probably some of the, the most challenging students possible. You, you get into sales and now you're sort of coaching salespeople. And if I'm right, you're, you're weaving all of that history together. Is I mean, that that's really statement? true. Yeah, no, it's really fair. Cause I, because I can't help, you know, I know that people often they get in, you know, especially being from the Bay area, there can be sort of a, you know, a woo woo vibe or a holistic approach to things that can get put out there and people can sort of poke at that. But for me, I, I truly can't separate performance from what's going on in someone's personal life. And I think it has to do with what I saw for the kids. Like if you're it's grumpy really and angry. It's super easy for people to kick dirt on this. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, seriously, you know, if you had to face your critics, ready, you know what they say, Aaron, I don't know. This sounds like a lot of, you know, liberal hippie jargon, juju, you know, and, and this isn't worth my time or money. No, I, I get that. And what's been fun for me is to take that, um, that data point. And for me, you know, I've worked with people in Dallas, you know, I worked with AT&T, with Walmart, I've worked with the store employees. For me, I, you know, I'm really not oriented towards taking a side of the aisle when it comes to business. I'm not oriented towards, you know, um, who's a Republican or Democrat. It's like, it's people doing their jobs, trying to make ends meet, trying to get ahead, trying to win. Um, and so to me, our emotions play a huge role in that. And partly what's informing this is I actually started, re- um, I'm a consultant now for Yale University. I don't think we've had a chance to talk about this, but they have an emotional intelligence. Yeah, no, it's excited. Thank you. Um, they have an emotional intelligence lab. Um, and now I'm consulting with them on their family um, their family practice and working with schools and helping them a little bit with some, uh, they have a corporate wing that's doing some work. Um, but the idea is that emotions affect attention. They affect um, memory. They affect performance. They affect relationship. So to me, you know, people who want to discredit the woo woo or the holistic, all those kind of, you know, West Coast liberal kind of stuff, they're missing actually the nugget, which is in it, which is that how we operate as people, how we feel, the more balanced, the more um, emotionally aligned we are the easier it is to do the things we need to do. And I would even say this is that, have you ever seen an angry person um, in a business setting really bring people on board with them? Really tough. No, no. People are averse no, to that. Nobody separator. wants to be, right. It's a separator. That's a great, I love the way you put that. Yeah. It's a total separator. So if you're trying to bring people on, if you're having difficulties at work or you're trying to build a coalition, um, you need to be, you know, a magnet. People need to be attracted to what you're putting out there. And, and I think the only way to do that is to have a, you know, a full life view of yourself. And if you're at home, um, you know, and people I've worked with, if you're going through a divorce or if your kids are, are having a really tough time, um, 
or things are falling apart outside of work. When you go to work, sometimes it can be really difficult. Some so, people, I would say, are amazing at being able to compartmentalize. And for those people, all the power to them and they should just keep moving. But not everybody do that. There's a lot of what I would cl- call sensitive or closet sensitive people who are actually really affected by their surroundings and the different people in their life. So, and one of the things I always thought was intriguing, and I realize this is sort of like, uh, you know, tabloid science, but um, one of the things that frequently gets cited is how many psychopaths make their way to the top of the corporate ladder. And I don't know if there's any accuracy to it or not, but it seems to be mostly because of that ability to compartmentalize. Um, I would say though- Or to not care. Right. <laughs> I guess, yeah, you got to take that. Like if I don't care about how anybody feels, if I don't care, if I'm not affected by anybody, I can just stay really focused and do my thing. And for the people who don't have that skill, it's a lot harder. Let them eat cake, Schiller. Right. Um, Let's eat cake. Uh, yeah. Actually, you said I would get cake if I did this podcast, right? That was part of the- you, The cake was a lie. Um, <laughs> as soon as you start to touch on feelings, people get weird in the workplace. And I, I'm wondering what your experience is in terms of like different messaging, right? Like I'm sure you've got uh, probably a slide deck or a presentation that you give that is very sort of dollars and cents oriented. And I, I'll bet you you've got one that's not as dollars and cents oriented, but more interested in sort of like um, uh, cultural alignment. Um, alignment's the word. I'm not, I don't know what the cultural is. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no, I do. And I, I think the thing, I, my response to that is like, you know, for me, the only way to teach you or anybody that I'm working with, how to know how somebody else may be feeling in a meeting is for that person to have a better sense of what it means to feel that way themselves. Yes. And so if I walk into a meeting with an executive or a general manager or a store manager, and I sense what I, what I am projecting to be some sort of distraction or maybe even sadness or some apathy or some feeling that I know that I have in myself, I then can, can orient the meeting, not to try to make it a counseling session. I'm not going to, you know, and it's an evasion of privacy. I'm not going to say to somebody like, oh, like you look really sad. Do you want to talk about it? But, I, but I'm going to at least change my tone a little bit. I'm going to be a little bit softer in the meeting. I'm not going to come across as um, gregarious maybe or as um, overpowering. I'm going to have a tone that allows myself to attune to that person so that they can start to feel safe. And then I will try to shift them. I will actually try to get them excited about something or find some way to distract them um, away from what they may be feeling. But that data point, around how someone else is feeling starts with having an understanding of how we're feeling. And the salespeople I talk to who are a little bit frozen, who don't fully have a sense of themselves and the different range of emotions really have a hard time seeing it in other people. And so I have to start with them by teaching them a little bit about feelings, which is a weird thing. And I think it's kind of a new approach to an old um, problem, but that's just the way I orient to it because I think well, and, that feelings and are it's data. obviously working, right? What you're doing is working. Um, Yale doesn't talk to people that are bad at this. Right. Yale would probably have said, this doesn't seem like it's a real thing. And, right. and that's that's as sort of low class and crass as I can evaluate <laughs> right. your work. I appreciate right? that, yeah. <laughs> that, that's right. as, as low of a common denominator as I can get you. Let's take Trump for an example, right? So okay. people are going to not say that he's like a woo-woo or holistic looking person, but he's, he won on emotion. He, he definitely conveyed, went on emotion. He used feeling and emotion to drive um, connectivity to an audience who got behind him and came out and voted and he won. And so we often orient, and this is also really important when you start talking about holistic, is that people think that we're talking about rainbows and unicorns. No, we're talking about the full spectrum of human experience from you know deep rage and anger to all the way to despair and apathy, right? And when right. you're selling, your ability to, to move across those range of experiences, to know what it looks like in other people... Um, I mean, I've been, you've probably been in these meetings, right? Where there's, you're selling to a, a group of people who maybe have talked to a lot of, um, a lot of different vendors. This is one of my favorite scenarios that people walk into that they miss, which is there's a room full of people who have been sold similar products. They've gotten a lot of pitches and you see one or two people in the room who look like they're experiencing what I would call despair. Like all these products suck and we're never going to find the vendor that really fits our need. I always, now, and it's funny that you say that. I always equate that despair with, do you know how much work I'm going to have to do if this goes through? <laughs> that's what, no, but that's really fair. I love that because that's another kind of archetype that often gets missed, right? And they could be confused. So what we just, you and I just saw the same feeling affect and projected two different reasons. But whether you're right or I'm right, 
Both of those are really interesting to play with in the room. And if you can find that out. So if you say to somebody, um, you go with your angle. Well, let's take mine first because that's what I said. But I start with, hey, like I can see you look like you look a little despondent. You look frustrated with this meeting. What, is it something that I'm presenting or is it just something you're experiencing? And they'll, they may often share, you know, I, I don't mean to be rude, but we've heard this pitch before. I'm not really clear on why yours is different. And then, wow, now your sales meeting just turned into something much better than you pitching something. Now they're oh going to start telling you what they you want your product now. to be. Yeah. Oh, now you have engagement. Now it's like amazing. I would prefer dissenters in a sale meeting over nobody speaking every single time. Oh, and, and I want every sort of junior person out there to start with this as a baseline. Objections I, are not the enemy. Objections are your friend. Path and to victory. Yeah. You, you can't go through a, a meeting with everybody saying yes and then expect to get a contract at the end. They're saying yes to get rid of you. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's totally true. <laughs> um, so we, you need the objections. And Aaron, you just said, okay, I can find someone through my sensitivity, my emotional intelligence, and I can identify that they're not in the boat with me. They're not going in the same direction as I'm going. Now what? And by approaching them, and maybe you don't want to be as direct. I definitely can tell you from my personal experience that nuance is not my my best attribute in these types of meetings. No, I, I mean, I'm very ham-fisted with this kind of thing. So instead of maybe saying you seem to be having some sort of anxiety about this or you don't seem to be like you're very happy with this, I will instead just sort of reopen my question asking, you know, my qualification style approach. I'll, I'll see that person and I'm somewhat sensitive to the fact that they're not happy. But then I, I can say, so tell me what's on your mind. And it's nice and neutral for me. And, and right. that seems a little bit more authentic to who I am. Because again, if you want emotional intelligence, you're talking to the wrong Mac Taggart. Uh -huh. You are looking for the lovely and talented Mrs. Mac Taggart. Right. Who, who has emotional intelligence off the chart. Um, uh, but at least but, I can but, identify but I think that's someone the point. expressing discomfort. But you as a salesperson have enough sense, and maybe your wife has taught you this to you over time, and you have just like picked it up through um, osmosis. You have enough emotional intelligence to read the room, to see the various things that are going on for people, and not let it unsettle you. You have enough of a sense of yourself and your own state of being. Um, this is where I sound a little bit like a guy from San Francisco, that it doesn't fluster you. But the people, Pass how the many reefer, times have you seen hippie. it? Right, exactly. Put the hippie tag on me. But if you sell more stuff because of this hippie, I want to make sure you send me a note if you're listening. Because the truth is, the better you know yourself, the easier it will be to read people and feel comfortable to address their concerns because that's what they want. Like, basically, I tell people, like, if you walk out of a sales meeting and you can't tell me a couple objections you've heard, you've failed me. Like, I want to hear the objections. I want to hear what they didn't like about it um, because that's where you really establish trust with people. If you're just picking the interview up in the middle, we're talking to Coach Aaron Schiller from CoachSchiller.com. And don't forget, there's a whole website attached to this uh, fine program, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.com. There you're going to find the Pitchcraft blog. You're going to find all of our podcast episodes that you can play right there in the browser. And uh, you can join the premium club where... You get to hear all of the interview, not just, you know, the 30 minutes that we carve out so that you can listen on your commute. So how'd you get started with, with consulting with outside companies? How did you move from being a rep to being a coach? I mean, I, it's funny because I remember us talking about this a couple of years ago when I was at Causes and I got into, I was working at a company called Place IQ, which was doing a location analytics software for advertisers. And it, Right. Honestly, I mean, I think the thing that changed me was I was just not really fit to work for anybody else. Like I'm really, one of the reasons I love sales is that I thought that I had autonomy and could do, do my own thing. And increasingly, I felt like as I worked for bigger companies and more sophisticated companies as a salesperson, I was just um, being asked to be a, not a, I, I hate to say it, but a cog in a wheel. And I wasn't yes. really having the freedom to kind of live the life I wanted to do. Um, I had a really hard time with being asked to be in the office at four or five o'clock when I wanted to be home with my kid and I knew I could do my work later that night. So it just became a, you know, a life choice for me that I thought I could pull off. And, and it also allowed me to do some other various things. Like, for example, like, 
you know, sometimes I'm supporting sales teams, but I'm also supporting dads who are trying to figure out how to be good fathers and be good executives. Um, so I, I get to do more of what I want. I get to diversify the things I do. I, I get to help my wife with her company called the Art Pantry, um, where they where she um, sets up art spaces for kids um, across the country. And so I, I think for me, the freedom to do what I want really became the deciding factor. One of the other things that we talked about when you were starting to make this transition was how lean startup principles can a lot of times leave a salesperson in the lurch because they have to go out and make promises. They have to put their own reputation on the line. And then the company decides that their product isn't what it was yesterday. And now you have to go and explain. Yeah, that's fair to call me on that. I mean, I definitely experienced like it causes. I mean, we had, you know, millions of dollars in revenue with, the, you know, the top, top 10 corporations in the country. And all of a sudden the platform started to change to a less corporate um, advertising friendly model. And we were just stuck high and dry. And it was really a challenge to be able to um, face the clients and then be able to transition them to other things. And, and it was just, you're right. There was something about being on the outside of the product and strategy of the company that just didn't sit right with me. Um, but, I, you know, but for me, on, on the other hand, this is from a product management perspective, lean makes sense. Yeah. Oh, you got to stay lean. I mean, for me in my own business, I stay lean. I, you know, I think lean, but I think the, the orientation of salespeople that a lot of companies has as, as on the outside of the company, where in the tech world, they have, you know, product and engineering as the center of the universe and salespeople as sort of a, a replaceable commodity on the outside, I think is often no dangerous because the salespeople are actually the ones that know what can make money for the company. And so, um, you know, the companies that keep salespeople close, keep the chief revenue officer really in the mix, um, I think are stronger company because engineers, I mean, that, the, and that was my favorite part of causes when it was good, when we were starting to sell this stuff to corporations, it was me and engineers working side by side. We did, we were small enough that we didn't have a project manager or, um, a buffer between me and the engineers and we could just, I could sell something. And then later that night or the next day, me and an engineer could kind of build it based on what I think they wanted. And maybe we'd bring in a designer. And that, that to me was the most exciting. And frankly, I miss that. I still am always looking for companies that I could get involved in that would allow me to do that kind of work again. Um, because it's just exciting. It's what tech is really great for is that how quickly you can rapid prototype things and get things out in the world um, and start selling. Startups and smaller companies bring diversity into the workplace, to borrow a quote from you know, one of our other guests. I'm very interested now in the methodology of how these companies sort of move towards being what the customer wants. But right. I do think that not enough people are bringing the sales team along for the ride. So Aaron, what, uh, what's the easiest way to get in touch with you if somebody has more questions? Yeah. I mean, you can email me obviously at Aaron at coach Schiller, but I've also become really old school where I'm like, you know, just call me. My number is 415-370-3767. And the reason I do that is, you know, it takes kind of some risk and some guts to just call somebody and ask for help. And uh, so I want to put it out there. If you have a product or you have a company and you're trying to um, figure out how to best sell it, or you're not exactly sure how to take a product and, and who to sell it to, um, or you just want to you know, get some support to take yourself to the next level. Give me a call. I, anybody who calls me, I'll give them a free half hour. Um, and if it seems like a good fit, then we talk about what working together looks like. So you could email me or you could pick up your phone and be old school and give me a call. And if they want to follow you on social media, because I've seen some of your posts, there's some pretty interesting things in there. Um, I do. I, you what know, are your handles there? I have a Facebook, Facebook at uh, Coach Aaron Schiller. Um, you could more than, more than happy to check me out there. A lot of the stuff there skews a little bit more towards, um, personal life and family, but, um, there's also some business stuff that floats there too. All right. Aaron Schiller, coachschiller.com. I, I got to tell you, I've, I'm glad we finally got this done. I'm just so excited that you started a podcast. Like you just have the golden voice. You know what you're talking about. You were just so helpful to me when I was going through a transition and just felt like a sales guy out on my own. I, I really... I don't think there's enough support for salespeople. It's a really tough, I mean, what job requires you to really get friendly with failure and rejection quite like sale. Um, and so there the fact that you're one. out here for people, the fact you're out here for people, um, I think is huge. And I hope people take you up on all the support you're offering and, um, you know, get after it. 
All right, that does it for this edition of the Pitchworks podcast. Don't forget, there's a whole website attached to this fine program, and it's at P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S dot com. Check out CoachSchiller.com. Give him a call. He gave you his phone number. I hope you have a great week. I'll catch you in about seven days. The Pitchworks podcast comes to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a production of the Epicast Network and McTaggart, LLC. Engineering and production by Buzzy Torek and Nick Miller. For more information, show feedback, and ad sales, visit pitchworks.com, E-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.com. On social media, find and follow the show on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram using that same brand name, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.